Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for today's presentation on the MPC research topic 462, which is implementation of aerial LIDAR technology to update highway feature inventory. The Mountain Plains Consortium, or MPC, theme is transportation infrastructure and operations to support sustainable energy development and the safe movement of people and goods. MPC is a competitively selected university transportation center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Transportation through its Research and Innovative Technology Administration. Today's presentation is brought to you by the Transportation Learning Network, or TLN. TLN is a program of the Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute at North Dakota State University and is a partnership with the four state DOTs of North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming, and the Mountain Plains Consortium. Our presenter today is Dr. Ziki Song. He is the division head for transportation, civil and engineering division, civil and environmental engineering at Utah State University. Dr. Song received his PhD in transportation engineering from the University of Florida. He's received several awards, including research of the year. With that, Dr. Song, I will turn it over to you to begin your presentation. Thank you, thank you, Chris. And uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank MPC to give me this opportunity to present uh, my research with MPC uh, through this platform. And uh, uh, I'm pretty honored today, and uh, I hope uh, it's good learning experience for you guys. And the topics today, as just as Chris just mentioned, I want to talk about implementation of air LiDAR technology to update highway feature inventory. And uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the funding support from MPC as well as uh, Utah Department of Transportation. Without their support, uh, this is research is not possible. And here's the outline of my presentation today. Uh, there are six parts. I will start with the introduction about what is highway feature inventory and why this is important. And then I will start talking about some uh, traditional methods used in the uh, practice, for example, um, uh, the manual data collection method. And then specifically in the source section, I will talk about LiDAR technology. Okay? And then after that, I will talk about the field experiment we conducted in Utah and then the data collection process. And the fifth section is about uh, this error bond LiDAR data processing uh, method. And also, we talk about some of the results uh, we obtained. And then, uh, in the end, we will talk about some conclusion we get and also some future research directions. So, so first of all, so why do we care about these uh, highway inventory, right? So, if you ask a DOT officials maybe 10 years ago, uh, they probably have no idea about how many signs they have. Right. For example, um, uh, for UDOT, right? So until recently, now we have a better idea about how many assets we have. Right? So for example, this picture you see here is uh, extracted from the 2009, uh, no, 2019 uh, UDOT asset plan. So you can see in Utah right now, we have more than 96,000 signs. But, but, but why this is important, right? So MAP21 basically requires each state to establish this uh, asset manual plan for better uh, preservation and better um, performance of the uh, national highway systems. And then, as you can imagine, if you want to cap this database and then conduct everything, conduct a survey manually, this will be quite labor intensive. So, so the, the motivation of this, is, this research is to see whether we can use some uh, airborne-based uh, data collection method to update highway inventory so that we can save money and save time. So that's the fundamental research motivation. And then now we talk about some of the research uh, road inventory method. Uh, well, well, broadly speaking, there are five categories, right? Field inventory method, photo and video log, integrated GPS, GIS method, aerial photo method, and then a lot of them are a bunch of uh, LiDAR methods. Uh, so in this section, we'll talk about the, the four methods, the first four methods, and then the next section will we'll specifically talk about the LiDAR data collection methods. So field inventory uh, is, uh, I think, most common ones. Essentially, you just drive a, a, a vehicle equipped with GPS, and then you will report all the highway features. When we say features here, we mean all the assets, so the, the light poles, traffic signs, um, traffic signal, guardrail, and uh, barriers, all the things you can can see on the roadway. Okay, so um, so field inventory method is pretty straightforward. You just uh, use a pencil and a pen, 
uh, paper and pen, pencil, and then you can just uh, record whatever thing you see on the roadway. The advantage of this method is very obvious. It's uh, low uh, equipment cost, and then you don't need a lot of training for your uh, crews. But the problem also is uh, very obvious. You know, um, you, it's potentially dangerous to the traffic and also to the data collector. And also, uh, it's pretty labor intensive. You have to record everything on the same. So compared with that, photo and video log is a little bit more advanced. Okay? So now uh, you, have, you drive a vehicle around, you have a, a camera that can take photo or videos, and then it's also equipped with GPS units, right? So you know where those pictures or video are taken from. So then what you can do is you don't need to basically record the, the highway assets on the thing. You can just uh, uh, record all the video and uh, all the images and then just go back to a lab or to, to workplace and then do some data reduction in-house, right? So the advantage is it's safer and then you get more time to work on the data so it's, it's considered to be more accurate and then you can skip, skip a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, the video footage that is considered efficient. But the problem of this, uh, this method is uh, it takes a lot of time to do data reduction in-house and also when the weather is bad, uh, this photo and video log answer doesn't work. So the integrated GPS and GIS mapping method is, uh, I, I consider it's a little bit uh, a little bit more advanced than the previous method. So now uh, you have a GPS, but at the same time you will have a GIS mapping system. For example, it could be a computer, it could be a, a certain handheld devices, right? So now uh, you get a little bit more advantage, right? So you can, for example, when you see there's a, you can still drive a car around, or you can just using the the, the, the platform I show you in the picture. So when you see some highway features, then you can uh, input or directly input those features into the computer. Right? And then you know the exact location of those, and then you also finish record, recording of the features on the spot. Right? So it considered to be, uh, again, low cost and high precision, the precision but, the, but the problem is, again, uh, very similar to the fielding center method. You're exposed to traffic and then potentially it will also impact by weather condition and all sorts of things. Okay, so the last one I want to talk about is error photo method. So error photo method uh, is if you look at these two error photos, right? So you can see the bridges, you can see some some of the signs. I think the advantage is very obvious, right? So you can uh, you don't need to go to the field. You just look at the error photos. You are able to identify heavy features. But the problem with this uh, method is first of all. Uh, the data processing for the uh, satellite pictures or error photos is requires a lot of professional knowledge. And uh, the second thing is, by looking at this two-dimensional photo, you probably can identify highway features, but you're not able to measure the dimensions of those highway features. Right? For example, if I want to know what, how large is the sign, how wide is the bridge, and how high is the tunnel, right? So you have no way to do that using this 2D images. So that's the limitation of the error photo method. So in summary, I put those uh, several methods into two big categories. One is a ground-based or land-based method. That, the, the other one is the error-based or space-based method. So it depends on the specific technology you use, I put them into three categories. One is if you just use land use, you just use GPS and then land use, land-based method that will be field inventory and integrate GPS GIS mapping system method. And then if you include now the, some images, right, so that become um, uh, more, you have more information. So that's the second second column. So that's the photo video, uh, video, log, photo video log method. And then if you do that through applying or in air, that would be the error photo or satellite photo. Now, if you introduce a new technology called LIDAR, then you get more information. And then this will be categorized into uh, this last column. So this will be the terrestrial LIDAR, mobile LIDAR method. Uh, if you do that through the air, there will be the airborne LIDAR method. Okay. So for those of you who are not very familiar with the LIDAR and this uh, LIDAR technology, so I will introduce that in the next uh, section. So, so LIDAR is the acronym for light detection and ranging. Okay. So essentially, this is a, a remote sensing technology. Uh, that uh, 
can collect uh, or can produce point cloud. So what is a point cloud? Okay. So point cloud, you can, you can imagine that's a point in a three-dimensional space. And then uh, basically for, for LiDAR scanner, they will shoot out a laser beam to an object. And then when the object reflects the laser beam back to the LiDAR scanner, so that will be a point in a point cloud. Okay. So you can imagine that if the LiDAR scanner scan this one object multiple times, the object will return many, many points to this LiDAR scanner. So that will form a 3D point cloud. Essentially, this will be, if, if the point cloud density is high enough, you will be able to look at the 3D point and identify the object. Okay. So I'll give you some examples. So if you look at the pictures uh, in the bottom, so this is a, a beer ball, right? And then when we, uh, when we use the LiDAR scanner to scan it, so a few points will return to the scanner, right? So you can see it's not continuous. It's not continuous point. The reason for that is the LiDAR scanner is rotating, and then they are rotating very fast. So there's no guarantee that they will uh, hit the, the object continuously. So that's why you can see that those are the discrete points. Okay. However, when you, when there's many laser beams hit the same object, then you will see something like this. Okay. It's not. It's not. It's not will be will not be continuous. However, we have a high enough point cloud density. You will be able to identify an object. Okay. So put that into perspective of a highway. So when you look at the picture on your right. So this, you can see this is a highway, and then you can see there's overhead signs, and then there's uh, the red one here is the, is the light pool. And now you can also see a beer board on the side of the road. And then you, when you look at the road surface, it's actually pretty clear, right? So you can even see the pavement striping on the road surface. So this uh, 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 picture was, uh, uh, was generated from a mobile data, light up data platform. Uh, from uh, UDOT. So you can see this point cloud density for this mobile platform is pretty high. Okay. By the way, the, the, the beer board point cloud picture you see, this is generated from the plane. So this is an air, airborne uh, LiDAR uh, point cloud. So you can see the points uh, are more, well, a little bit, uh, I would say, less dense than the uh, mobile LiDAR platform. Okay. So in terms of the uh, platform, we can do LiDAR scanning, so there's a terrestrial and mobile, so those are the ground-based methods, and then airborne is the, is the, uh, is the plane-based method. Okay. So how, how LiDAR works? Well, I kind of talk about that. Basically, LiDAR scanner will shoot a laser beam, and then the object will reflect the laser beam back, and then this time difference, okay, so basically the time for the laser beam to travel from your scanner to the object and then return to the LiDAR scanner. So those time difference I multiply by the speed of uh, speed of uh, light and divide by two. That will be your exact distance from your LiDAR scanner to that particular point. Make sense? So using this method, if we know the position of LiDAR of our own LiDAR scanner, we will be able to know the location of the object far away. Okay. So if we have equipped our LiDAR scanner with a GPS unit and an IMU unit. We'll be able to generate the 3D information of the target object. Okay. So let's talk about the different platforms. So the terrestrial LiDAR, you can see, is put on a tripod. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so it's very similar to a total station. And then you put the LiDAR scanner on top of the tripod, and then the LiDAR scanner will rotate. Okay. And then the limitation of this method is, as you can see, it's, uh, it should be fixed in, at one point. So the, the range this uh, terrestrial LiDAR can cover is very limited. Okay. But the benefit of that is because this fixed point uh, data collection method, so, so typically it can give you very high resolution, very high density um, point cloud. Okay. So mobile platform has been used by many uh, DOTs and used very often. So this uh, white vehicle you see here is a, a mobile LiDAR uh, data, collect, data um, uh, collection vehicle uh, by Oregon DOT. Okay, so in this figure you can see there's uh, this mobile platform consists of a few parts. 
obviously we have the GPS on top, then we have a scanner, so the scanner is a LiDAR scan. And then they equipped with two cameras, one facing front, one facing back, and then we have IMU. So IMU basically is to track the, uh, the, the speed and also the direction of the vehicle so that they, they kind of know where we're heading. And then the DMI is to measure the speed, okay, the very precise uh, speed and location of the vehicle. So com using this combined, combina in combination with MU, they will know the position of the vehicle uh, at all time, and also the information from GPS. Uh, so the, the, the picture on the bottom is, is a, a LiDAR a data collection vehicle uh, used by UDOT. Essentially, this is actually this is a, a vehicle from a private firm called Mendeley. So you can see very similar configuration, right? So at the back, you see there is a big LiDAR scanner. And then in, in the front, you see there's a GPS unit. And then there, there are a few cameras attached and also their IMU and DMI unit equipped on this week. So Airborne LiDAR platform is actually very similar to mobile LiDAR platform in terms of the configurations. Okay, so essentially you just took all the equipment you have on the vehicle to a plane. And then uh, the interesting about this uh, Airborne LiDAR platform is the, uh, is the shooting angle. So you can see, well, when you do that at the back of the vehicle, uh, typically, you, feed, you use your LiDAR scanner to face, to, to, well, to face uh, at the back, and then there's a, uh, the angle is not, uh, uh, is not uh, well, I, I would say, a sock not to the roadway. But when you put the LiDAR scanner on, on the plane, and then a typical angle you use is a sock not view. But again, uh, you could use some uh, technology to, to kind of uh, change the, uh, the angle a little bit, but, but that's, a, that's, a, that's just a, some special technique you need to use. But the thing I want to say is uh, for airborne LiDAR platform, the, it offers a very unique perspective. And then you, it, it uh, uh, can see a lot of things that, that mobile platform won't be able to see. And also because of the height of the plane, uh, the, use the same LiDAR scanner, you can actually cover larger area because the laser beam now, even use the same angle, you can cover much, much larger areas. Okay. So uh, some a checklist of a typical component, you will need to have a flight management system, you will need to have a plane, <laughs> sorry, plane, you will need to have a scanner, you need to have a, a system to know where you are, so basically IMU and GPS system, and then you have a computer to record everything. So in terms of application of the airborne LiDAR, uh, in this study we're talking about using LiDAR to do have an infantry data study, and then they have been using this system. People have been using this system for curve flow estimation, have a corridor mapping, and then here's a table summarized the pro and cons of different LiDAR methods. For airborne LiDAR method, uh, the the one of the issue is the uh, for vertical features. For example, you want to know what's the information on a traffic sign. Uh, it, it might be difficult because the angle of the laser scanner. Okay, for mobile platform, uh, the major issue with mobile platform is the slow. I would say the slow coverage. Uh, the reason for that, first of all, the vehicle, the mobile platform, you can't drive very, very fast. Right? So you can't drive very fast. And uh, the other thing is the footprints of the mobile data is limited. For example, it can cover let's say two lanes, so that then if you have a 10 lane or, or five lane per direction highway, then you need to probably run this mobile platform several times of the same stretch of roadway to, to build a, a complete mapping of this corridor. And for terrestrial LiDAR, the limitation is very obvious. They uh, fix a particular point, although the cost is really low, but the project size that terrestrial LiDAR can do is very limited. So not very suitable for the highway infantry study we are talking. And then now let's move on to the field experiments we conducted in Utah. And then uh, in the plane we use, we use a fixed wing plane. It's a Cessna single engine airplane. So there's two systems we mounted on the plane. So there's one LiDAR system. There's also multi-spectrum and thermal infrared cameras. Okay. So the reason we have the cameras is we figure we have a LiDAR system. And then uh, why not we just also throw in the cameras because, you know, have a space, right? So these two systems will generate different uh, data sets for us at the same time. 
the airborne LiDAR system definitely will give us LiDAR information, basic point cloud. And then the cameras will provide our, us our error image information. Okay. So this uh, data collection uh, was conducted through remote sensing service laboratory in the civil engineering department of Utah State University. So here's the plane we use. It's a single engine Cessna uh, plane. And then what we did is we basically took out all the seats at the back of the plane. Well, we still have one seat for the data collector, as you can see on the picture on the right. And then we, in the plane, we have, um, we have a lot of computers, we have a lot of hard drives to record the information. And then the one in the middle, you can see there's a camera, it's this high resolution, multi-spectrum camera. And then in the front, yeah, you probably cannot see very clear, it's a LiDAR scan. Okay, we put a LiDAR scanner in the front. It's also facing down toward the Earth. Okay? And then you can see there's a seat at the back, so the, the operator or data collector can monitor this data collection effort. So for the data collection uh, study areas, we did uh, four sections of road in Utah. Uh, the reason we choose this four section road is uh, they are considered to be representative of different, uh, uh, different uh, roadway conditions. So I-84, uh, this is more like rural interstate. Uh, so this is connecting um, Ogden to Park City and then I-15 North, I-15 South, they, these two sections are one more urbanized you know, environment, the other one is more, more rural or suburban areas. And then U.S. Uh, 191 is more uh, the state highway and then it's more rural areas. And then for this data collection effort, for this four section road, uh, their total length adds up to about a little bit less than 80 miles. And then we did a data collection uh, we finished the data collection pretty quick in probably one day, okay? uh, and then <clears throat> they, here's the data pr processing uh, steps we did in-house. Okay? So the picture on the left, you see that's the uh, flight trajectory. Okay? So you can see we, we have a lot of turns in order to cover I-15 because the curvature of the road, so sometimes we need to flag back to cover this I-15 uh, entire width of the road. So that's one of the reasons you see that a lot of, uh, lot of circles. And then we use WePoint software to process the raw GPS IMU data. And then we use two softwares, uh, RI, uh, 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 re-analyze uh, and then reprocess to process the LiDAR information. And because because we fly this uh, interstate several times, so you need to stitch all these LiDAR images or LiDAR point cloud together. So that's the working process you see in the software. So you can see different color means different, um, different um, uh, wrong, and then we just stitch them together um, to become one single big LiDAR point cloud. Okay? So in terms of the accuracy of the LiDAR data we collected, we choose to use uh, USGS uh, uh, standards. Uh, we specifically uh, evaluate two things. One is the relative accuracy within individual swaths and then within swath overlap regions. For those two criteria, two criteria we, uh, we measured, uh, both of them either meet or very close to the USGS standards. And then we didn't uh, directly measure the vertical accuracy but based on the, our previous experience, I would say it's most likely achieved the, uh, the vertical accuracy. So, so in summary, our, uh, the, data, uh, the airborne LiDAR data we collected uh, meets uh, a very high, very high uh, uh, requirement by USGS. Okay, so basically, that's very accurate. Right? So later, when we look at this point cloud, will be able to use the XYZ information provided by the point to identify those uh, highway features. Okay. So how this uh, uh, airborne LiDAR data processing uh, looks like. So in this figure, I show you two sets of pictures. Okay. So the, the upper ones are what, are the, what those features look like um, in the real world. Okay. If you just look at, just look at uh, pictures, what it looks like. And then the bottom one are what they look like in point cloud. Okay, so for example, we look at the first one, the overhead sign. So you look at the bottom one, you can see we see the low road surface, and then you can see those uh, uh, 
uh, green dot. So again, they are not continuous point, but kind of can, can know, well, this should be uh, more high signs because well, there's not a lot, lot of signs above highway, right? If you, if you see some structure like this one, it will be uh, uh, all high signs, okay? So by looking at, I would say, by looking at the point cloud alone, it, you actually can identify a lot of the highway features manually, right? However, you can imagine this is really labor-intensive work. If you go, this, uh, if you just work on this LIDAR data, uh, well, feet by feet, you will be able to identify a lot of, a lot of highway features manually. Okay? However, this really takes a lot of time. So in order to reduce the um, processing time for uh, post-processing time, we developed this uh, uh, RxJS-based uh, algorithm. Okay? So the idea for this uh, algorithm is actually quite straightforward. We figured that there are not a lot of uh, so-called features or assets above the highway ground, right? above the ground of a highway. So first of all, we want to find those uh, uh, those features above the highway as a potential, we call this candidate point. And then we can use uh, the menu method to check on each of the potential points, or we can call the candidate point, to identify what kind of feature it is. Okay, so the workflow of this uh, uh, this procedure is, is look like this one showing in the slides. So after we receive the raw point cloud, we first will develop a raster. So what is raster? Essentially, it's a cell with uh, we, we divide a space into cells. Okay. So in this study, the raster size is uh, is uh, one one uh, well we use one meter. So each cell is about 10, 10 feet square. Okay. That's the size of, of the the cell. So we figure that this size is small enough for us to identify features. Okay. So what we do here is we will first divide the space into raster with, uh, each raster is about uh, 10 feet square, and then we will look at how many points from the point clouds fall into each cell or each raster, okay? So for example, if it's a ground surface, then the points fall into this uh, cell will probably have very similar elevation, right? So that's a C range elevation. For this kind of points, we can say, well, probably, most likely, it, it is not uh, going to be any highway feature or any highway assets. Okay. However, if in the cell there's a large difference in terms of uh, the elevation or the Z range, we figure that there's something happening there, right? So it could be either a sign, could be a light pool, could be a guardrail, could be barrier, could be something there. It could be also vehicles, could be something there. So what we do here is we will we will single out those cells, and then we will do a clipping. So what clipping does is we'll look at only those cells that uh, we're interested above the highway. For those ones that are not about highway or very far from highway, we will just uh, kick them out. Right? And then now we have uh, so-called candidate cells. So basically, those are the cells that potentially will have some object within the cells. And then we will check those cells manually. So by doing that, we can potentially identify road, uh, roadway assets. And then after we identify what the asset is, we will geolocate those assets. And then we put them, put them into a database. Okay, so that's the workflow of our XGS-based algorithm. Okay, so I will use this example to demonstrate what we have done, and then maybe this will help you better understand what we're trying to do here. So the first picture uh, at the top left is, um, see the red one, so that's the raw point cloud. So basically from this one, can't see a lot of things, although this is, again, this is a orthogonal view, you won't be able to see a lot of things. So what we do here is, we will first divide everything into small cells, 10 feet um, raster. So then you got this uh, blue ones. So you see the, for this blue one, their elevation difference will be different. Some of them will have a higher elevation difference. Some of them doesn't have a lot of difference. So we will throw away those cells with a small elevation difference. And then we get to the third picture. Uh, that's the bottom uh, left pictures, right? So you see that, you see a lot of a red dot here. So those are the potential cells 
that has some objects inside because of their elevation difference. And then you can see a lot of them are outside the roadway, right? So we don't need to look at those points. So we just keep basically cut them away, right? But you, as you can see here, a lot of the red points outside the roadway, they actually, they are the, uh, the top of all the buildings. Yes? Okay, so after we do the clipping, so now we only have those candidate cells along the highway. Okay, so that's the that last picture you see. So again, when look when we look at this picture, there's uh, again a few points are red, but this uh, effort you need to uh, check is much much less than compared with first red figure. Right, so now you have some candidate locations you can check. Okay, so by checking those candy locations, we can figure out whether it's a traffic sign, whether this is a light pool, whether it's a guardrail, or whether this is a um, this is a, 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 a beer board or whatever, right? So this is the workflow we use. And then, in terms of the experiment result, here's the result. So for these four sections we covered, uh, we 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 ask uh, actually we hired a few undergraduate students. And then they sit in lab for, for a couple of weeks, and then they were able to use the method we proposed to identify all the features, features and then they put that into this GIS map. Okay, the features we're interested in here are the traffic signs, overhead signs, street light, beer board, bridge culvert, and the barriers. Okay, uh, you can see we didn't cover small signs, and we'll talk about that later in a few, a few slides. Okay, so for all the signs, or all the features we're interested in here, we are able to identify almost all the features comparing with we compare our result with, with the database provided by UDOT. And then they, they match each other, uh, match with each other pretty consistently. And then I would say it's pretty effective in identifying those the features, at least the features we, we, we are interested in here. And then it also provides some unique view, for example, the bridges and culverts, okay, they are not currently identified by the mobile LiDAR data platform, but uh, we're able to uh, find those uh, in uh, using our you know, airborne LiDAR platform because of the different angle we, we provide. Okay? And then we compare our result with the existing database, which is provided by uh, the mobile data, mobile LiDAR uh, platform uh, used by UDOT. Uh, it's conducted by a company called uh, Mendeley. And then here's the comparison direct compile of our result versus their, their database. Okay. So the green uh, hexagon here is uh, the, the location of the billboard identified by the mobile data platform. And then this uh, black uh, triangle, uh, triangle is those uh, location of billboard identified by our airborne data platform. And then you check each of them, they match each other pretty well. So there's a little slight deviation in terms of the precise location. But they match each other very well, I would say. Okay. And also, uh, the we using our airborne lidar data, we were able to identify culverts and uh, bridges which are hidden from the mobile platform. So I just show you two cases here, right? So you can see uh, from the lidar platform, it's pretty clear. You can see there's a, there's a culvert, there's a, there's a bridge, but if you just scan that through the roadway, you won't, won't be able to see anything below the road for surface, right? So, so that's a, some additional benefit of the of the uh, airborne ladder platform. However, we do notice some uh, some limitations of our airborne ladder platform. So, for example, those speed limit signs, those warning signs, with the smaller signs, uh, we really cannot properly identify them. The reason for that is our plane. The flight height is relatively high. We are flying about uh, um, uh, 1,600 feet above the ground. And then the speed of our plane is about uh, 180 miles per hour. So the point cloud density we obtain is about 0 0.6 point per square uh, feet. So that means that translates to, for example, let's look at a speed limit sign. If you're lucky, you might be able to get, uh, uh, let's say, two to three points. Okay, so if you just look at a point cloud alone, you won't be able to identify whether this is point, whether this is a pool, or whether this is a, a, a traffic sign. You won't be able to do that. However, uh, if you combine multiple data sources, uh, this airborne ladder data could be still helpful in, the, in identifying 
smaller feature like the sign. For example, when you look at the Google Earth image, right, so you know there's a sign there. You know there's a speed sign. There. You just don't know the exact location of this speed sign. So then what you can do is you can go to the LiDAR data platform and then just look at a few points, we collect it, and then you will know, okay, well, this will be the exact location of this sign, right? And then you can put this sign into your database. So that could be a that could be a, uh, that could be something um, um, you do if you really want to use the airborne data platform to identify smaller signs. However, uh, we, we find that if you just rely on the uh, LiDAR, airborne LiDAR platform alone, then you will get the relatively low point cloud density for the smaller surface areas and you will have some difficulties in identifying it. Uh, and uh, so now we come to the conclusion of our, our study. We found that uh, airborne data platform, uh, data collection platform, is actually pr promising in identify some highway features. For example, guardrail, median, light, light pole, and uh, large signs. Okay, uh, for smaller signs, uh, we are not uh, be able to effectively identify them unless you use multiple data sources. Okay, and then airborne LiDAR has some uh, unique advantages because they can provide a different perspective, so they are be able be able to identify hidden features that are not, you cannot identify them through the mobile platform, okay? And then we figured that you wouldn't be able to entirely use uh, air drone LiDAR uh, to do your highway inventory. So the best method is to combine different uh, data sources and then by doing that, you might be able to uh, achieve the maximum level of accuracy. So in terms of the future work, here I will just give you one slide to give you a sense of, uh, or give you a flavor of what the things we're, we're doing right now. Okay, so in this, in the previous study, what we have achieved here is we only look at LIDAR. We haven't uh, utilized the image information we collected alongside the LIDAR data we collected, right? So it's a waste of information. So what we figure is, can we kind of use information from both data source and then can we do a better job? So here's one example I can show you. So for example, we look at a highway, we try to identify uh, traffic signs, okay? So by, look, identif by looking at the, the purple one, that's the LiDAR data. So by looking at the purple one, we figure, well, there are maybe three potential candidates that could be traffic signs. Okay, but we don't know whether they are. So the traditional method will be you go, go back to the image or go back to the LiDAR point cloud to see whether they are really a sign or something else. Okay. So what we're proposing here is we could just use the, the image information collected at the same time, right? So we can use some image processing algorithm to check whether they are signs or not signs, right? So here, the three candidates here, we use some um, algorithm to run, we figure that, oh, this is a, clearly one of that is, is not a sign. It's pretty much, it's weak, right? So it's not a sign. So the computer will rule out this, this potential candidate location, okay? So by doing that, we can further reduce the, uh, the workload of the data collector, and then we were able to speed up or automate this um, data collection process. So that's some, uh, something we're doing right now, and uh, um, so hopefully, uh, we can be able to share more about uh, this future work uh, in the near future with you guys. And then here are some further reading if you're interested. So the report to this particular research has been published on the MPC website. So the first thing, you can download this report. And then we also publish a journal paper in the journal called Measurement. And then here's the link to the journal articles. And then if you're not able to download the journal article, you can just feel free to email me. I will be able to just email you a copy of the journal article if you're interested. And then uh, I think that's all of my presentation today. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I will turn this uh, uh, turn back turn back to Chris and maybe open the platform for, for questions. Absolutely, great job. Yes, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and key those into the Q&A now. So again, questions, any comments anybody would like to make? And as maybe you're formulating a couple questions, I would like to just take this opportunity to thank Dr. Song for the time and for sharing his research findings.
Uh, obviously, very practical research, very applicable research for the states if they're not currently using it, and maybe some tips and tricks to help improve the process that they're already doing. So again, thank you for that. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending today's TLN event. Visit our website at translearning.org. With that, Ziki, I'm not seeing any questions come in. So again, okay. thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thank you, everyone out there. Uh, thanks for your attention and your time this morning. And have a safe day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.